45 minutes. I've been given 45 minutes to talk about something that I could talk about for hours. Um, the thing I want, what, what's, what's great about following the keynote is if you saw the keynote and you ta saw what Ed was talking about in terms of the phases of the NoSQL database movement, we are in this you know, transitioning phase two, phase three. The phase two concept that I really, you know, I took home and I really liked because of his comment, if I stand here, I'm gonna be in the way, is that we're really looking at, a, we're at a point in time when we can use NoSQL databases like Couchbase to replace these big, mission critical, enormous relational databases that have really been running the companies for years and years. Um, I was around when that transition happened from IMS and hierarchical database into relational. We're in another, a new transition point. And what I'm really here to do today is, is really help discuss what it takes to actually make that transition happen, not from a technology standpoint. I think that's really, you know, if you, Ravi talked about some amazing features that are in, in the new Couchbase server, Couchbase mobile. I'm, talk, I'm here to talk about how do you really get your, your enterprise colleagues, your cohorts, the people, quite frankly, who are not necessarily you know, in love with NoSQL technology the way you are, how do you get them on board? How do you get that transition to make sense and, and take place inside your organization um, and, and do, it, do a good job of it? Because it's not easy. There's a lot of forces arrayed against these kind of technology changes, not just whether it's a NoSQL to relational, uh, it makes as much sense, and almost any time you look at a new technology change, you're gonna have these problems. Uh, we're gonna zip through this agenda. We got about 40, 40 minutes to go, but I wanna really talk about just a little bit about who I am and why, why you're here. Why, particularly when you're looking at this from an enterprise line of business, these decision makers who are so critical, why is, why is NoSQL not a no-brainer? Why does it take a, a change in mindset? Uh, who are these people in the line of business and why we should be talking to them? Uh, how do we do some translation work with NoSQL uh, homework? And then I want to finish by talking about teamwork a little bit. So who the hell am I? I'm an enterprise software bigot. I've been in this space for God knows way too long. I'm a reform techie and I say reform because I, I started life as a programmer, software developer. I uh, transitioned to a world of really the translator interpreter, sitting between the two. I spent a, my whole business is really predicated on helping line, the business side understand what tech is doing, helping tech understand what the business side is doing. Um, I've been doing this for 30 years and one of the things I wanna emphasize here, I've spent 30 years watching the best technology fail. Not succeed, but fail. It fails and it fails for all the wrong reasons. But these are the reasons it fails for it nonetheless. It doesn't always win. What's, what wins is the best story told to the right people in the right way at the right time. And I'm gonna tell you a story that dates back to 1989. 1989, um, I was a reporter covering the relational database market. And I interviewed this guy named Larry Ellison. You might have heard of him. Now Larry at the time, first of all, I could, a guy like me could interview a guy like Larry now. I don't think anyone does or wants to. By the way, are there any Oracle lovers in the room? <laughs> Good. Good, because uh, otherwise I'd have to put my shield up. We'll hear a little bit about Oracle today. And I said, to, now, now 1989 was three years after their IPO. And, and I'm telling you this partly because I hope you can see where, where this can go and you get the paradigm right and the story right. IPO, 1986, they came out, they were doing 55 million a year. By the time I caught up with Larry, 1989, they were doing 580 million. Three years, 10x growth. That was the nature of the market then. That was also a nature of Larry as much as anything. And I said to him, how the hell did you do this? You know, what was the secret? What, what happened that really made the change? He said, you know, I realized that, you know, we were the cool kids. We were, believe it or not, we were the, we were the cool ones. We were the ones with the new technology. We used to show up in our leathers and our, our Harley and, <clears throat> you know, and, and ask the CEO if he could, we could date the daughter. The, and, and he'd look out the window and go, no way, you know, you guys are too wild and crazy, you're too cool. We at the CEO level, we at the, the enterprise level, forget about it, go do those crazy Skunk Works projects, go, you know, they worked a lot with aerospace and events, but, but when it came to really core enterprise, the, the model that Larry was using in, in Oracle didn't work. He said literally, and he said, I put this in an, an article I wrote, an interview I did with him, he said we literally went out 
and, and got a gray suit and a tie and an old Chevy. And then when we came to knock on the door, we could get, out, we could, we could get the daughter out of the door. And it was a metaphor maybe we don't want to use today. It's a little, well, it's a little Oracle-like. They got Mark Hurd there now. Um, maybe that fits. Uh, but the point being that there's, a, there's, there's not just a great technology story that has to be told. There's a great business story that has to be told. You have to do this thing that I, that I, I tell all my tech clients that you know, the job of any good software company is to sell hope to the line of business, some hope about some great business outcome that's going to happen, and at the same time sell comfort to IT, make this a technological change that makes sense for the IT side. You've got to do both simultaneously. You've got to tell the right story or you end up, you end up in, in, this, in this no man's land of, of failed technology. And what's interesting about the story that needs to be told today is the top side of, the top half of this, this slide, things really aren't different today than they were in 1986. Business disruptions, expanding customers and user bases, better user expectations. We didn't really talk about brick and mortar to infinite scale, but we certainly talked about changing how tech, the, the role of technology in, in companies and taking it out of a little skunk works operation or a back office operation to something much bigger. This is exactly what, what Oracle's trying to do. What is different, dramatically different, is what's, what's driving the story today. Web and cloud data, mobile and device processing, machine data, you all know about this. These are, these are the stories that, that have to blend together in order for there to be set, a success for Couchbase and for the projects you, you are trying to spearhead to really make, make sense in the enterprise. And the problem is there's a lot of, there's a lot of institutional inertia. You're actually, and I've been this, seen this a hundred times over, I've been involved in a very big project with a partner, we've been analyzing enterprise software success and failure, and we've looked at literally thousands of projects. And what we find is, is, is these components of institution, what we call institutional inertia, that inhibit even the best laid plans. And, and again, to, to take off where we were from the, the keynote this morning, or this afternoon, you've got to really be part of that transition from the Skunk Works cool project into this, this, the core of the enterprise. And the core of the enterprise is a huge barrier and it's called the relational database. And if you haven't, <laughs> haven't been paying attention, these are the guys, these are the incumbents. And these incumbents don't just exist as core technology in, in the applications, they exist as a, almost a cultural phenomenon around, particularly if you look at the Oracle market, you've seen this I'm sure before in companies you've worked with or worked for, there's a core set of Oracle DBAs, there's a core set of Oracle bigots, like myself and enterprise software bigot, they do everything they can to protect their turf. They've aligned very much with a lot of business users who, who frankly are, you know, really couldn't care less about the underlying technology. They want results, they're very results oriented, and they, they, they work hand in glove. Every time you try to get a new project going and a new idea going that involves a new technology and a new platform, NoSQL being no exception, you're up against these guys. And, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to do this. I mean, you fight them head on, and we saw a lot of, you know, I thought what Ravi was talking about today in particular really opened up a world of, of, of technology that makes a lot of sense for going up, up against an Oracle uh, head to head. But there's a better way to do it. And, and, it, and this, what I want to talk about a lot today is this, this line of business influencer. What we've got is a real inflection point. It's been happening actually for a number of years. But if you look at what's, what, what, what we've got here in the, <clears throat> in the green, the green response is that's traditional IT. That's, that's mm, for the sake of argument, where most of you live today. The, the yellow and whatever we're going to call that copper color are really are two new categories, new being from the influence standpoint, categories of influencers. These are business managers and what they call in this survey the business panel. These are the people who really have P&L responsibility for success. They're the ones not driving essentially a technology platform strategy as much as they're tri driving a business success strategy. And more and more they have a seat at the table and whether they're, and, and what's interesting about this, as you move down this, this graph, you get to set the cell internally. Who are the people that sell the ideas, the technology internally? And I think this is, this is where a lot of things are lacking. We're, we're at the, this, if you look at what my business people are doing, they're not really part of that sale, that internal sale. 
And it's because they're not, in my opinion, being influenced by the likes of you to do something about changing the technology platform, about doing a better job of getting something like NoSQL in the door. They, but one more down, if you can see it, with the, if that's not in the way, you've got their ability to authorize and approve the deal is, is, is increasing and, and rather significant, almost, you know, almost 44%, 43%. That's a lot of influence for people who aren't actually necessarily the ones you're talking to today. Who are these line of business influencers? I, I'm gonna, I, I took off my jacket, it was too warm, but, but this is, you know who these people are. They're, they're the, it's the business side. They have a, a P&L responsibility, a business management role. They are the end users. They're the ones who literally say, we want outcomes, we don't care what technology looks like. They're almost the antithesis of most of the developers here today who really thrive on the kind of technological advances that, that Couchbase is putting in the market. They're saying, no, we're not, we don't care. We really don't care. You got three gerbils and some, some bailing wire and a duct tape. Great, as long as it meets my needs. And in fact, they're not necessarily IT department's best friend. I've been as a, as a consultant in the room with the line of business proposing con conceptually new projects, new technology, and they literally say, well, let's get this rolling before IT hears about it. Because as soon as they do, they're gonna put a stop to it or they're gonna come in the room and demand a seat at the table. They always muck things up. They always tell us we can't do things. So we're not really gonna let them do that. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a problem, a dissonance between what, what line of business is doing and what IT and development are doing. And, and I'm gonna bring this up several times and, and we'll talk about it at the end of my talk because really what's needed for success at the big enterprise level, at the place where the money really matters, where the projects are, are in millions of dollars and the stakes are really high, what really matters is teamwork. Technology and business have to work very, very closely. In our analysis of over 2,200 IT projects, the number one key to failure was, was a dissonance between these two sides, between the line of business and the IT, between the, the implementers and the people who they were implementing for. And when those two groups don't work together and understand each other, the project fails. We have, in fact, one of, one of my friends who runs a, a big CIO program <clears throat> over at the business school across the bay puts it this way. He says, if you can't get these two groups working together, cancel the project and save yourself a lot of trouble. So part of what I want to do is kind of help you a little bit understand what's going on in the other side of the, the fence and help that drive some of the, the your ability to get in there and make your project a NoSQL project and a Couchbase project. And one of the big problems is the language that gets used. And, and I, I guarantee this means absolutely nothing to the line of business. And no, an industry leading solution that includes a shared nothing architecture, single nodes type, built in caching layer. I mean, really, you know, you, you really don't have an audience for this kind of discussion when this is the language that's being used. And literally, again, when you've got a bunch of people who are sitting in the room hearing <laughs> about this and seeing this, and quite frankly, you know, I thought, I thought the keynote was great because it was sort of showing this, this side, the tech side, which is really how Couchbase has grown up. This is what you guys do all day. This is what programmers do. This is absolutely deadly, most boring thing a line of business person could ever look at other than other than I don't even know what. And, and there's, this is part of a perceptual problem because as you guys do this, there's, there's a certain mentality that comes with it. You're really, this is a heroic effort. And I mean it seriously, I've been there, I've done that, I've worked with programmer teams. I think there's, there's nothing, no joke about how, how whether the, the team, you know, they, we talk about ninjas, we talk about the um, <clears throat> Star Wars, we talk about knights in shining armor because this is really how, this is a self image and quite frankly, it's deserved. This stuff is hard and tackling new, new technological concepts. I've been there, I've done it, it's fabulous. It's a real, it's a real guess. Now, the problem is, this is what the business side is looking at. You all are a bunch of, <laughs> wow, they're a bunch of druids sitting around, you know, smoking something. Uh, they're scratching your head and, and if, you're not, if you're not crazy, your job is, uh, from, the, from the IT standpoint, to say no. And this, this sets up this dissonance that, that really means that the two sides are having a lot of trouble communicating. What keeps a line of business up at night is very, very different than do we have the best new net new technology. They, they're scared, if you, you know, if you remember borders, they're scared of being uh, roadkill 
on the business highway. They're scared of watching their numbers go down, getting eaten alive, and, and being you know, the next burnt toast. So this is literally what they care about. Technology, they couldn't care less. So fundamentally, when you look at what is, you know, how do you present, how is NoSQL presented? This is not a sleeping pill. This doesn't help anybody at the business side sleep well at night, though. And I, and I say this with all due respect to McKnight Consulting Group, who put together this very nice survey, which is sitting on the Couchbase data uh, website. These are not the factors that matter in the business side. And in fact, again, you, you, this is the conversation that when it comes to this level, you, you put, you know, you, you're putting your folks to sleep. Um, one, of the, one of the real reasons I want to bring this up is because it is, it is essential that there is a way in which you, you can understand how people want to communicate, and this isn't the way to do it. I mean, Couchbase doesn't necessarily make this easier. This is not what a business person wants to understand. A business person looks at this, and quite frankly, to be honest, they're scared shitless. Why are they scared shitless? Because if you've made, made, as you know, in any hierarchical organization, you rise to a certain level because you're smart. And you're smart and you have to be the smartest guy or woman in the room all the time and you're, you're a VP of procurement, you're a VP of supply chain, HR. You're smart. You look at this, now you're stupid again. And, and literally you are because no one understands this who's spent their life in procurement or supply chain or HR or logistics or any of these business functions. They don't get this. And, and I literally, I've, seen, I've seen this happen where literally there is, there's, a, there's a CEO, a tech CEO on one side and a business CEO, CEO level. These guys should be, they should be paying, they should be best friends because the two of them need each other and neither of them has the language to actually communicate. And literally this story was told to me by a tech CEO who said, you know, when he met one of the CEOs of one of his biggest clients, he said, what did you talk about? We really didn't talk. I said, you know why he didn't talk? Because he read your website and he didn't know what the hell to say to you. And he was afraid of looking stupid. And, and I, you know, be, be, be aware that these, nobody wants to look stupid. And, and this stuff is hard. This stuff is hard for the business. Particularly business people who think in these terms. How do I do, improve business performance? How do I integrate across multiple locations? That's a business problem, not a technology problem. I need to position myself for growth. I need to serve my customers, regulatory compliance. Et cetera, et cetera. It's a long, long list of business problems they want to solve, not technology problems. They don't want to solve technology problems, except maybe the second one, replace the legacy system. But that's only because the legacy system is impeding the business problems, not because they want new technology. They think in terms of industries and lines of business. And actually, you know, functionally, every, every app you're ever going to build that's going to be meaningful is going to, is going to live in a matrix of an industry in a line of business. It's going to have this function and these people, these, because the decision makers live in this world, you know, you're, really, you're really going to need to reach out to them and make sure that they, they get it. <clears throat> they look at key performance indicators, customer service and satisfaction, time to market efficiency, DSO, DIO. Anyone know what DSO and DIO are? There's one. You know them both? Yeah, these guys are wearing sports jackets. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> I took mine off because I have to be on both sides of the equation. But if these aren't, you know, if you live in the business world, you know, day sales outstanding, days inventory outstanding. Days inventory outstanding is the most absolutely critical, critical metric you can have in any kind of operation where you are selling to a customer and you've got to watch the bottom line because if you've got too much inventory sitting in the back office, you can't sell fast enough to pay for all that inventory. Day sales outstanding, I won't even go, go into. These metrics really matter to people. And, and part of what I'm doing, and I do this a lot, I run workshops like this all the time. I want you all, I encourage you to think about, you know, can you, can you have a conversation about any of these things? Or be in the room and these, con these concepts are coming up because this is, this is where this is where teamwork begins, this understanding of what the hell these, these terms mean. If you get, you know, and they go further. I mean, this is a call, call center is a really great place because you guys have some interesting applications in the call center world. Call center is a very dynamic area. A lot of big data problems, a lot of the problems we heard about this morning come to a, come to a nexus point sitting in the call center where you've got customers, you've got service problems, you've got products, you've got catalogs, you've got, you may be doing sentiment analysis in real time. You're trying to, trying to make that customer as happy as possible. 
And if you, if you have, <clears throat> If you have your cost structure screwed up so that you, you know, your cost per minute of handle time is out, your quality is down, your average speed of answer is down, you're, you're going to be out of business. doesn't matter what technology you built that on or not. <clears throat> Most importantly, the business side is really looking for new business opportunities. And that, again, is part of the mindset of what, is it, what does it take when you want to walk into an organization your line of business people and really get get what they're up to. It's not just about a, you know a new technology. It's about how do I how do I do new service models? How do I do a better job of overall efficiency? What can I do about my partners? How do I make this a more personal user experience? How do I deploy <clears throat> my assets? These are opportunities running in your and the other thing is you know you know this because you li live live in these companies. You're running at the speed of of the enterprise today. We talked about you know network and and um, <clears throat> and memory as being the, 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 the big latency, throughput being the big latency problems. There's no latency in business. There's, there's, I'm sorry, there's, there's no time off in business either. The speed of, of business, the dynamic functionality of the business, the changes they're, they're, they're required to make in their business model in, to respond in real time to whether it's a seasonal product opportunity coming up, a new partnership, a merger, an acquisition, it's all happening. It's happening so fast that in a funny way, what, you know, the, 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 the speed of business change is paralleling the speed of technology change. The kind of stuff that I think Couchbase is doing in terms of making the Couchbase server a better product, the, mob, the mob, mobile stuff, again, we heard about this morning, is actually in sync with the, with the velocity of business. Because if you're going to have a better personalization, user experience, deploy your ass, if you're going to do all these things, you know, one of the things you're going to do is have it on a mobile platform. Now, if you discuss it, unfortunately, the way it's discussed in a technical audience, you're gonna, you might lose your audience, but fundamentally these, what, what, what Couchbase is doing from a technology advancement level is actually synchronizes perfectly with what the, what the line of business is doing. So how do we talk this language, Couchbase, Couchbase Enterprise? I can't even pronounce it. <clears throat> Part of the problem, again, is, is the, you know, the technology, the tech talk really, 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 really doesn't make any sense. My favorite is actually is auto sharding. Okay, could you could you translate that for a business audience? You don't have to. You, you can just nod your head and yes or no. But you think you could? Yeah, not trivial necessarily. No, it's possible. But you get it that they don't they don't understand it. Built-in caching, maybe auto sharding. No, no SQL mobile. Mobile, they get mobile. They all know what mobile is. I, I want to I say why this is important in a very fundamental way. Anybody remember this campaign, the beginning of this campaign? I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. Basically, Intel went out to consumers and said, guess what? There's this thing called a, called a CPU, and, and it matters what CPU you have. Now, the best, very best PCs, how many have had an Intel-based PC that sucked? I have, it doesn't matter, we know, it could be an AMD, it could, it, we don't care who makes it, we know there are other, we, the tech world, know there are other functional requirements that are much more important than what is actually in that. In fact, the, the, how you assemble the other parts are much more important than, than the CPU. The, the numbers on this are fascinating. Brand awareness grew, I have to read this, I couldn't memorize it, wild night last night. Brand awareness grew in Europe from 24% to 93% in four years after launching this campaign. In the first year they did this campaign, their overall revenue grew worldwide 63%. Now, this wouldn't be the only reason, but brand awareness, the, the Intel Inside idea, has been one of the great branding operations. Couchbase Inside, they haven't started it yet. That's sort of what we're starting here, is that when it, you want to really say that every great business idea can be solved with an application that has Couchbase Inside. These are three, three examples of projects I just did with, with some of my clients. These are, this is the spec in one sentence. We need to do a better job finding out who are our prospects and pointing them to the right goods and services. We need to be able to closely monitor our products in real time and what goes into product selection. Every one of these is a great use case for Couchbase. 
nobody in the meetings I'm talking about is specifying a database. They're telling me this is a business problem they want to solve. And if we go back to this sort of, this crazy, if you will, <laughs> crazy, this, this very typical way of talking about Couchbase, part of the problem is how do you translate it? Maybe the best way to translate is just that this is the best way to build the app that will solve business problems, increase the profit and loss, meet your key performance indicators, make your company more successful and help you sleep at night. This is the no bullshit version of what Couchbase does and I want you all to try to think about and, and by all means, Get, get as good at it as possible, particularly if you want to make that transition phase, into phase two, into this big enterprise project, mission critical application world, then really go into the next phase, which is the replatforming. Replatforming, you think it's hard to build a mission critical app with a new technology. Where do you try to replatform on a new technology? Platforming is a, is a multi-year process in many large corporations that the elbows and knives get out People are entrenched interests. You've got to have a, the, the, selling that is, not, is no longer a technology effort. In fact, most of the thing, I will say that anyone who thinks at the high end of the enterprise software space, what Couchbase wants to be, anyone who thinks that product selection and, the, and technology selection is a rational process has never done it before. It is simply not rational. There's a million factors involved. And, and, and a lot of them have to do with how do you communicate so, you know, when you, when you look at this, what the hell, who the hell is JSON? I mean, literally, you'll get that question. And, and does anyone want to, does anyone think they could tell a business person what, what it meant to have JSON? Any, any, anyone want to take the bait? I have, an, I, have a, I have a Maserati I can offer. <laughs> <laughs> like the one, <laughs> that other one. This, this is, this, you think you could do it? Maybe, yeah, right, right. Uh, I mean, if they, go to the, if they go to Wikipedia, this is what they get. I don't know if we all agree with this, but this is what Wikipedia says. Does this help a business person understand that this is why they should be with Couchbase? Not really. This is, this is great techie stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, if, if we take those, those, those concepts of what is a business problem and look at it, this is, this is my, my interpretation of, of these terms. Just, just for the sake of how do you make a description? Why is Couchbase important? Well, we've got this thing. We can run faster and better. We, well, no errors, no delays. You've got, you got an unbelievable, un, unpredictable load. Hey, we got this thing that, that'll take care of that. That's huge. The infinite scale problem is absolutely essential. Companies, there is nothing worse than planning in a retail business for a seasonal order that you can't fulfill because your damn back office just crashed under the, the load of your very successful marketing campaign. I mean, there's, there, there's no, no screaming goes on that's louder than the merchandiser yelling at IT when the, when the system crashed because it couldn't fulfill the orders. That's really cool. JSON, and I like, I like the, I, again, what's happening, the business side is getting this. It's not just a bunch of transactional data. What went on in the back office is commodity. That's old shit. We know now, we've gotta be looking out at, at what's our social media strategy? How do we integrate that with, with our product development? How do we think about what is the customer doing? And how do we get to know the customer a little bit better? And eventually, one day, once we've assembled all this, we're gonna place an order into the manufacturing system that's gonna go into the ERP system, and now it's gonna go trickling down that old back office that's just sitting there, boring as hell and not very interesting. So they get, they get that something has to change. They don't get the language, but they get the functional issues behind it. <clears throat> so I, um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is your homework. Um, I'll be grading it. You can send it in via my email. I'm kidding. But the point is, you know, I just pulled this off of the Couchbase website. I'm, I'm going to guess, actually, you probably don't even have to mention any of this stuff when you talk about Couchbase or the, or the capabilities. But this is, again, part of the problem is when they go out and look at what you're, what you're proposing, this is some of the stuff they see, and they really have no idea what this means whatsoever. So I'm, I'm, and this, for the sake of time, winding up as 
relatively quickly. I also want to open it up for some questions. But I really, I, I've been watching a phenomenon in the enterprise software world that, that I find really fascinating. I was working with a, with a big Silicon Valley company doing a big HRMS system. And the lead person on the business side came to me and we had to start having this conversation and said, wait a minute, you're, you're not an HR professional. And she says, hell no, I'm, I'm from IT. I said, how did you do this? So well, I'm learning on the job, but I've been seconded to the HR department because they need someone like me in place, in house, talking their language and the tech language. And being able to do that, to get out of the cube and be part of the conversation is really, I think, important. And this big picture, what is DSO? What is DIO? It actually makes sense, I hate to say it, you know, for, for tech people to understand these business terms because these are the terms that, that the conversation is going to be about. Um, I run workshops where we, we pull together business people and IT. And frankly, we pull together all, a crazy assembly of people from the entire company to sit down and how do we, how do we make a difference in the company? It's a, it's a conversation that, that most companies don't have. They don't have that teamwork built into their system. They're very compartmentalized. IT's over here, business over here. In fact, business, the supply chain guys never talk to the procurement people because they're on two different sides of the fence. HR is in its own little thing messing up your lives and your insurance policies. And, and this, this cross-pollination of ideas is really how technology will be transformative in the 21st century. And it's got to come from a blend. You can't sit in your ivory tower on the business side or on the IT side and actually be successful. And the teamwork, the teamwork issue I'm going to conclude with, when you look at IT projects overall, of which you want to be part of the big enterprise IT world of, of massive multi-million dollar projects and huge stakes at hand, risk all over the place, failure is Unfortunately, the norm, 41%, according to one study of projects, fail to realize 50% of the benefits. They don't even get the halfway mark. They don't get some benefits, 22%. Operational disruption at go live. Can you imagine? Have you ever been there when your app went live and it took down the company? Probably not, because you wouldn't <laughs> be drummed out of business. I've seen those. I've seen those projects go south. Uh, Executives unsatisfied, um, it should be executives screaming their heads off apoplectically. And of course, employees' dissatisfaction is huge. Projects screw up all the time. And, and the main reason is this issue of teamwork, that, that actually behind all of this, why don't they reach, realize benefits? Guess what? Who wasn't in the room when they were building that, that database schema? Who wasn't in the room when they made, this, they made a decision about which vendor to go with. The, the, the lack of cross-pollination leads to these enormous failures. You get away with this when you're in a proof of concept. You get away with it when you're in a small project. When there's $10 million, $20 million, I, I see projects that scale up into the hundreds of millions of dollars range. Failure is not an option. It happens all the time. It's, it's unbelievable, and it's fundamentally due to the lack of teamwork, the lack of cohesion between the two, the two sides. <clears throat> and what is it, the end game? Okay, I'm picking on Oracle big time. Oracle did, how many of you know, know, know who did the Oregon ACA site? <laughs> Oracle. How many have ever heard of a vendor preemptively suing their client for malpractice? Does it, Oracle did it. Um, they actually sued Oregon before Oregon got to sue them. If you look at these, the, the, these filings, which I have, what you really find is a complete disconnect. They're not talking to each other. They're throwing, Oregon, Oracle's throwing their crappy Oracle consulting guys more and more of them at it. Or state of Oregon is frankly not, they're not dancing at the ball either, necessarily. And now they're in court, $300 million, I think that was the number, two to $300 million down the drain. Um, you know, the, uh, the entire state of Oregon went, went to the federal system for ACA, and they're still dead in the water. This is the end game for the teamwork gap. And I'm, I want to be a little bit scary in saying that because when you want, if you want to get to phase two and phase three of what we heard about today in the keynote, you got to worry about the, the consequences of failure. So, in conclusion, I'll give you four, four bullet points. 
the processes you're trying to enable with technology are themselves in a race to, to differentiate before they become commodities. Every, every company has a core set of business processes that, that they have to do because they're a regulated industry and the FDA will shut them down if they don't. They're a public company and the SEC will shut them down if they don't. Then there's the stuff they try to do that differentiates themselves, that makes them smarter, better, faster, that gives them the leg up on the competition. That stuff is changing all the time. And, and, and the better they are at it, the, best, the better they are at it, the, best, the more that becomes a best practice, and the more that best practice becomes a commodity, and now they've lost their advantage. Enterprise business processes are the difference. You need to be part of the difference in order to, make, to help your company grow. And, and that means moving up the food chain. Influence flows up, and the more the, there are people with executive and global and senior in, in on the conversation, the more what you're doing at the tech level will actually make sense. Fundamentally, be practical. These guys have budget. They have approval. They have authority. The business side makes as many or more decisions at the top end of the enterprise as IT does. IT really, if you ask any CIO today, are you a business person? Executive, they go, oh yeah, I am a business executive. Because they can't afford to admit that, if they don't say that, they're out of the conversation. They're, they've got to be in the conversation because these guys have clout and power. And finally, as I said earlier, you want to sell hope to the line of business, comfort to IT. You get to play both roles. And if you play both roles successfully, everyone gets to win. That's my talk. Thank you very much for being an attentive audience. I think we got a couple of minutes. Are there any questions? Any Comments? Anybody want, want the homework assignment again? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. So there was a, a thread on Harvard Business Review a few months ago talking about the CMO. Who knows what Harvard Business Review is? No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> it's talking about how the CMO is going to take over the job of the CIO. Any thoughts? Am I allowed to say the word bullshit loud enough? That's, the Gartner Group has, has been pushing that idea for a long time. And it's, it's a really nice idea because it, it, it purports that there's this huge shift in the influence. And marketing gets a lot of, in, has a lot of influence. Again, if you look at the kind of apps that are, that are in the Couchbase world, a huge number of them flow into the marketing world. But absolutely not. They're not, without a doubt, really nerdy things like procurement and supply chain are key. You know, so you all read that, that HP is, is Wow, check that out. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Lenovo, for interrupting my talk. Um, <laughs> OK, Jennifer, thank you as well. The, um, if you read about the HP breakup, the reason HP didn't want to break up for the last five years was actually they had no synergy in the, in, in the front office. They couldn't say, they couldn't, there no single salesperson could ever walk in the door and say, I'm selling you a server, I'm selling you a, a, a bunch of PCs and printers, and we got some IT services. There was nobody who could do that. But what they did have is synergy in the back office. They have the most powerful supply chain in the, in the world, and they're able to squeeze cost out of that like nobody's business. That is a core best practice of HP that everybody envies. In fact, it's why Meg Whitman has been hesitating until she's totally desperate to break the company up. This stuff is not sexy like the CMO stuff that we read in the marketing, but, but it's, it's, it's core business practice and it makes a huge difference. And in fact, there's going to be a big project over there at HP when they split these companies off because they can't have that one supply chain. Yes, go ahead, please. We've been thinking about the line of business versus the IT executive. It seems like the, there's a lot of uh, budget that's going from line of business to the, the IT executive, and they become a, a pretty big decision maker to build to do the replatforming. We don't see the replatforming happening at the line of business executive. Thank God. That don't know the yeah, you don't want them to, do, to have a, have a, have a you know that's not their job. And, and you wouldn't want them to. They would, you know, I, I can tell you what happens when line of business replatforms. Uh, you end up at a, a very well known cloud company, very service may, many of you may have. They let their lines of business essentially, essentially buy any app they wanted because it was cheap and easy. It was all, as long as it was cloud, you could have it. Guess what? They've got a back office with 80 siloed cloud apps. 
And they're now re-platforming, and they're, they're going to invite these guys to the table, but frankly, they're not going to let them make that decision again because AD apps in the back office suck. So you can't, you can't have that. But, but when you're re-platforming, you're still going to have to have these business issues taken, taken into account. They better have a seat at the table, or I guarantee the re-platforming won't work either. More? Going once? Everyone got that message center plus? That sounds so good. <laughs> Listen, thanks a lot. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for sitting through this. I appreciate your time. <clears throat>